Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. More on them a little bit later. Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading, and we're finally taking a look at Imposter Syndrome, the latest mini-series from the IDW run. And anytime they introduce a new character into this canon, fanbase is usually in an uproar, and it's especially interesting this time around because of the two new antagonists we're getting, who we will get to in just a moment, but first, let's start this story, which kicks off from the perspective of Dr. Starline. And all he's basically doing is recapping what Eggman and Sonic are all about, and his problem problems with both of them. He's telling his video diary of his plan, Operation Remaster. With this plan, he'll finally be able to break what he affectionately calls the Sonic Cycle. So basically, the rinse and repeat formula of Eggman versus Sonic going on forever and ever without any evolution or change is what he wants to bring an end to. And of course, there's some meta commentary there with Ian using famous phrases from the fandom like the Sonic Cycle and talking about remasters. And I personally think it's a very clever way to entail this into an actual story. And I have to wonder if this is some kind of a commentary on the fandom feeling like they know what's best for Sonic. Or <laughs> certainly couldn't be blamed for anything like that. But yeah, we'll analyze that a little bit further at the end of the video. For now, let's keep going. If you've been keeping up with the series or, well, with speed reading, then you already know what Starline's been up to. Taking a first sample from Tails, creating the Tricore, analyzing the complex design of Bell's brain. All of it was leading up to the creation of the two mystery creatures that have been hiding in those green vats that we've seen before. The first of these creatures is meant to replicate Sonic, as we see a green streak make its way around an obstacle course. Nothing too dissimilar from what you'd see in a level of one of the Sonic games, even taking down Egg Ponds and that Lumberjack mini-boss from Sonic & Knuckles. This is Surge the Tenric, a vicious, violent, and volatile creature with all the speed of Sonic, all of it powered and amplified by electric abilities, and I have to wonder if this is a nod to movie Sonic. But why while she is meant to replace Sonic flat out, Starline does admit there are a lot of other flaws to Sonic's core design, as he sees him as some sort of a project to analyze. One of Sonic's weaknesses is the need for an analytical balance, and that comes in the form of Kitsunami, the sad, submissive clone of Tails the Fox. And as you can see, he has a lot of hydro manipulation powers. So yes, obviously these two are meant to be evil versions of Sonic and Tails. And you can see some similar dynamics, but they are different enough that that they are their own characters. And golly, you have to wonder if that is also a meta commentary for something else that's rather notorious when it comes to Sonic comics. Anyway, Surge completes the course, quite proud of herself, but instead of being met with praise, Starline tells her that she left Kit behind. To which she argues, it doesn't matter, she made the record. Starline waves it off, saying that she's only proven her proficiency in a controlled environment. They're not ready to get onto the main missions that Surge so desperately wants to get started. But when Starline says that they're not ready and they need to test their skills in the field in another way first, she grows impatient, grabbing him by the collar and telling him that she's real tired of him talking down to her. But Starline is quick to pull out his hypno glove and puts her to sleep, doing the same to a startled Kit. So yeah, as we've seen before, after he lost the warp topaz, Starline fit himself with a new arsenal, one of them being these hypno gloves. And while they do have their limitations, he has built Kit and Surge specifically weak to these abilities, keeping them in control whenever they get out of line. And as they wake up, he gets them back on track. And as we see in the next couple pages, they're the ones responsible for all the calamities in the mainline series, including the forest fire of the National Park and all the chaos in Central City. While all this is happening, Starline pays a visit to Tails Workshop in Emerald Town. Yes, the same one from Sonic Battle, I know guys. And I love that he takes a moment to comment on the fact that it's Tails' face, saying that Tails takes after Dr. Eggman in some surprising ways, and I guess that is true, isn't it? He's here because he believes Tails is smart enough to figure out what Starline is up to if he ever analyzes Bell. So Starline is here to basically destroy any kind of research he might have. But unfortunately, even with the Tricor, he can't make his way into the workshop as it's very well reinforced. Kit and Surge show up to his location, sending Kit straight to work on the workshop where he too is unsuccessful. So without wasting any more time and not wanting to bring attention to themselves, they rush back to the base where they discover that Sonic's friends have already taken care of all the commotion 
destruction caused by this troublesome trio. But it wasn't their goal to actually burn down the forest or destroy Central City. Those were just field tests to see if Surge and Kit were ready to take on something bigger. For Surge, she assumes that means that they're ready for the main mission, but Starling still has one more test to do. But Surge, once again, is at her limit, declaring that she was given the power to destroy Sonic, so let her destroy Sonic. Starline replies calmly that he gave her the power to change the world, but it will only work if they follow his plan. So before they take care of Sonic, they first must remove Dr. Eggman from play, and they can only do that once they strip him of his support. But before they do any of that, they must test out a bypass algorithm that Starline has created on a remote base. The next couple pages are really only here to show off the dynamic between the three. The impatient Surge wanting to jump in head first and just get to what they were meant to do, Kit quietly recommending that they play things safe only to get yelled at, and Starline quickly pointing out how Surge's headstrong attack could go wrong in so many different kinds of ways. Surge continues to yell at Kit, who just apologizes, which just makes Surge yell at him even more, telling him to stop cringing. They won't be able to take out Sonic if he's acting like a weakling, to which Kit once again apologizes. And the poor little blue boy is just at his limit. He just breaks down crying as Surge yells at him asking, why do you even want to help me? To which Kit responds with tears in his eyes, I don't know. And that surprisingly distracts the temper of Surge as she realizes she's not sure why she wants any of this either. She's never even met Sonic, at least she doesn't think she has, and it leads the two of them to begin questioning what they're even doing. Kit asks her, do you still want to destroy him? Surge tells him, yeah, but she's not sure why. And without an answer, she turns the question back onto Kit and he just says that he wants whatever she wants. Twitch Surge asks, why? And after a pause, all Kit can say is, once again, he doesn't know. At this point, Starline Board just raises up his hand and reboots, shutting them both down. As per usual, he begins to talk to himself a little frustrated. He thought keeping things simple would make things easier, then questions if he should build up a fake backstory for them. And while he's questioning all this, Surge gets back up, wanting to know what he did to her. At this point, Starline shoves the hypnotic glove directly in her face <laughs> until she collapses completely, with Starline looking a bit unnerved. This might be the first hint that maybe she's becoming resistant to these powers. He then makes his thoughts internal, not risking to speak out loud once again. And he says something rather interesting here. He had used Bell's base code to write personalities for Surge and Kit, and in turn he expected some more stability and control. There's something different about Surge and Kit when compared to the likes of Bell, and obviously we can tell that simply by the fact that they are organic creatures. Whatever the case is, Starline has invested too much to start all over. He's just gonna have to be a little more more careful going forward. He believes once he puts them onto their primary objectives, things should even out. So it's time to get the ball rolling. He wakes the two of them up with some BS story about them glitching and showing them a lot more fatherly love than he ever has before. And you might also notice that Surge has been messing with her ear this entire issue as well. I wonder if that's going to come back into play. Anyway, Surge asks confused about what is going on with this glitching, to which Starline says that yeah, we got into a heated argument which overloaded their upgrades. And basically, just gaslight Surge, saying that it was her idea to do one more test. And with Starline acting apologetic, he says that he was wrong and he agrees that they should do one more test. Surge looks confused but says that sounds about right. And with that, this brings a close to part one. Part 2 kicks off with yet again another video diary from Dr. Starline, this time explaining why it's so important they do one final test before they lay out the mission that he has planned. The base they operate from was once Eggman's, but they only managed to get a hold of that because Starline relied on a backdoor exploit of the Eggnet. If he's ever going to truly topple Eggman, he's going to have to relinquish control of everything in Eggman's power. So before they do that, he's going to use Surge and Kit to take over Egg Base Alpha. Outside of the base, he uses Kit's ability to control water to form a map of the base, which is really cool. I like seeing all the different ways he can manipulate water. The plan is that they're going to enter on the south end. From there, Starline himself is going to enter a control tower and upload a command program. While that is happening, Kit and Surge are going to ensure that no broadcasts are sent out to alert the Eggnet. They also take this moment to confirm that Eggman is indeed a gamer and throw in a Pingus joke, 
which, very clever, I didn't catch that my first time through. Serge begins to question the plan, but Starline reminds her that this was her idea, even though it wasn't, and they set off to work. Serge is supposed to act as an escort for Kit, but she's not happy with that whatsoever, even if she believes that this is her idea for some reason. So she completely ignores what he wants to do and begins a full-on assault on some bad nicks. Kit nervously reminds her that they're not supposed to raise any alarms, to which she counteracts by saying that they can't make any kind of an alarm if they don't exist anymore. Kit nervously reminds her that these were Starline's orders, to which she quickly dismisses it by saying that he's not the boss of her, he's just tech support. She plans to do things her own way way, and it's Kit's job to follow her. That's simple, and it's how it works. But even after all that bravado, she still plans to make her way over to the tower. Might as well do the stupid plan while they're here. Meanwhile, Starline casually strolls in, as he always does, into his planned tower, but is distracted by the egg cave, which you might recall from the second annual of IDW Sonic. And he tells himself that he's ahead of schedule, so he can afford a small detour. While all that's happening, Surge and Kit make their way over to their planned tower, but they're greeted by a giant egg. Egg mech. She tells Kit to take care of the tower while she tackles the boss. We turn our attention back over to Starline, admiring all the junk in the egg cave, including old school bad nicks and some of the Sonic action figures we saw in that annual. And while he reminisces of a simpler time, he turns his attention over to the mechanical Starline action figure. A little reminder of how disposable Starline was to the good doctor. And once again, we see Starline's true goal here. Yes, he does plan to supplant the doctor, but he's still desperate for his own admiration, even though he ironically can't give it to Serge and Kit himself. The comic turns his attention back to Serge and Kit, with the little water fox believing that Serge has been crushed, which causes him to freak out and show off the full potential of his water powers. As it turns out, she is just fine, and they finally take down the big bot, but unfortunately they find themselves surrounded by a bunch of badniks. But before they start their attack, the badniks applaud them. As it turns out, Starline had succeeded, and now he has full control over the base and all of its badniks. And when they finally all meet up again, Starline finally praises the two of them for all of their great work. The override was a success, no alarms were triggered, the plan went flawlessly. It's now time to begin the master plan, after a wardrobe change, as Starline realizes that Surge is a little bit messed up. And while Kit shakily tries to explain, Surge quickly jumps in, saying that she was a little careless, and that Kit was a big help. So yeah, as toxic as their relationship seemed to be at the start of the story, it looks like these two are finally, truly bonding. After Starline dismisses the two, Surge takes Kit over to a room without any cameras or any mics, and the two of them should be able to detect that with their abilities. As it turns out, while Surge seems to be doing all of Starline's bidding unquestioningly, she's actually been showing a little bit of restraint. Things aren't adding up to her, and she thinks that Starline's behind all of it. And now that she knows that she can truly trust Kit, she is counting on him to help sort out what's actually happening. So while Starline readies his master plan, Serge and Kit concoct their own secondary one behind Starline's back. And that is where part two ends. Before we jump into the next issue, let's talk about that project you've been holding off on for far too long. You know the one, that comprehensive gallery of pizza-themed underwear. Or maybe you're trying to sell some pizza-themed underwear, and you need an online storefront. Or perhaps you need to put a menu online for your local restaurant which sells underwear-themed pizza. <laughs> What am I talking about? <laughs> okay, maybe your ambitions aren't quite that weird, or maybe they are. Either way, this is where our friends at Squarespace come in. I've personally always been intimidated at the idea of getting my own domain and my own little slice of the internet, but it took me just a handful of minutes to get down the basics once I checked out Squarespace myself. It really is that easy. They walk you through everything. And after that, it was just super fun customizing everything to my heart's content. Heck, if you already have a domain name, you can just transfer it over with their easy to use tools and do whatever you want with it. And if you're wanting to take whatever project you're working on seriously, the tools to track your growth, put together your own ad campaigns, integrate with social media platforms, everything you need to be a functioning business is right here and just as easy to understand. It's very little effort to get something clean and professional up in front of the world. Trust me, nothing feels quite as cool as having your own domain on a business card. And to make it even easier, if you head over to squarespace.com slash game apologist, you will get 10% off your first purchase. Thank you again to Squarespace for supporting the channel, and let's get back to it.
Part 3 begins with yet another video diary with a very flustered Starline. This recording clearly taking place soon after Eggman's betrayal during the Metal Virus Saga. And we see subtle little hints of that with the lack of a Tricor or Warp Topaz in his glove. And Starline manically screaming that he was planning to show off this revolutionary prototype. And that does kind of look like Metal Sonic Kai. At least the chest area there. Maybe it's a reference to something else. Maybe it's alluding to something else brand new. I don't know. But I'm sure we're going to see something with that down the road. And the recording ends with Starline screaming into the camera that he will build something that will run rings around Metal Sonic. No sloppily constructed badniks, no over-specialized vanity projects, a versatile, robust, superior creation. From here, we cut to recording a little bit further down the line, one that clearly took place during the Bad Guys arc, or maybe a little bit afterwards. As Starline explains that his time with Zavok had opened his eyes, his initial plans were very short sighted all the power and obedience of a machine means nothing in the chaotic and unpredictable world that he is trying to control. He needs the will and ingenuity of a living being. So yeah, again, if you go back to Bad Guys and remember that conversation he had with Zavok, you can understand where he found this inspiration. And this page ends in quite the twisted way, as Eggman has said he spent all his time inserting animals into robots, when the true solution was the other way around, leading to the reveal of Kit and Surge in the green gooey vats. I think this is actually the very first time we got confirmation that those two were in those glowing tubes. I mean, we kind of figured up to this point, but yeah, obviously these two are in a lot of pain. We cut over to the present and we realize that it's actually Kit and Surge that have been watching these video files. So once again, Starline is screwing himself over by recording all of his thoughts and leaving his allies to discover it for themselves. This is literally why his plans fell apart during Bad Guys and he has not learned anything. But so far, this isn't anything really damning for Surge and Kit. They understand that they are created creatures. They keep watching video files with Starline explaining the purpose of everything he's been tracking down in the comics. So the fur of tails, the coat of Bell. As it turns out, Starline didn't want to just recreate the free will that Bell has. He wanted the ability to control them without them actually realizing it. And this is where Kit and Surge realize they are susceptible to his hypnotic abilities. And this is where things get truly twisted, as the next video files show hypnotherapy sessions with Surge and Kit, implanting their simple desires of destroying Sonic, and in Kit's case, devoting himself completely to Surge. On top of all that, we see a lot of footage of the two of them failing quite a bit. I think it is kind of alluding to them maybe not potentially dying, as they explain that they are quite resilient with their upgrades, but at the very least, there's a lot of psychological trauma from all the tests he's put them through. And since he can't erase their memories completely, completely, as it would kill the point of the trials if they never actually learn and memorize anything, he instead revives them and suppresses and edits their memories. So yeah, again, this is a kid's comic. They can't flat out say that these characters are getting murdered over and over again, but it is kind of treating them like lives, you know, like he's treating them like actual video game characters, and he's just playing a game of Sonic the Hedgehog, where Sonic never actually dies, but you can still lose a life. And when you think about it in those terms, it can be quite traumatic and terrifying. Man, we have a lot to take apart with these characters. This is fascinating. But here's the real kicker. Here's the actual terrifying part for Surge and Kit. She realizes that they are cyborgs. Sure, he has implanted upgrades and other things inside of them, but he didn't make them from scratch. That means that they had their own lives and personalities prior to Starline. That's the craziest part here. We weren't sure what was going on with them. We just assumed because they were in vats and stuff that they were just created in a lab, but no, there's more to their story than we or even they realize. Surge is desperate for more answers about their past and tells Kit to look through the archives even further, but Kit can't find anything, which Surge finds ridiculous. There are so many video files and they're so detailed, why wouldn't there be anything about who they were? And that's because it's irrelevant, at least according to Starline, as he enters the room with a bored expression saying it's past their bedtime. As it turns out, this isn't the first time this has happened. Starlin reveals that this exact scenario with all these revelations have happened before, and it always ends the same way as he raises up the hypnotic glove. But this time, things turn out differently as Surge covers her eyes and sends Kit after him, who looks like a straight-up demon. I love that. Starlin activates his tricor, and a fight breaks out, and he holds up his own 
against the two quite impressively. But ironically, as Starline said himself in the videos, they have been learning, and these two have finally learned to work together as a duo. Starline himself forgets all about Kit, who grabs a hold of him, and Surge takes a hold of his hypnotic glove and uses it on the platypus, knocking him out. With the platypus incapacitated, Kit asks, what now? And Surge says that they're going to burn it all down. Sonic, Eggman, every idiot that follows either of them, no more heroes, no more villains, nothing. If they don't get a past, then nobody gets a future. But she's not quite sure how to make that happen. But the quiet Kit might have an idea or two, and surprisingly, Surge doesn't scream at him, and instead opens the floor to the little fox. And he suggests Starline already has a plan in motion, one that will bring everybody together. They could keep following the plan he has set in motion, but add up particular point, take it in their own direction. One that does destroy Sonic and Eggman, but also Starline as well. Of course, if that's okay with Surge. And she absolutely loves the idea of taking Starline's own plan and using it as his downfall. So with a plan in mind, Starline wakes up in his chair, confused as to what's going on. Surge tells him that he had put himself to sleep during his own monologue, <laughs> saying that Starline had been filling them in on the details, pre-mission prepper some other such nonsense. Starline's a little confused. He's not sure why Surge is fine with everything going on here. To which she says, well, if I wasn't before, I'm pretty sure you wiped that out of my brain. Convincing Starline that his hypnotic abilities had properly worked on them and they're fully compliant with whatever he's got planned. And he falls for it completely. So with all of that settled, it's time for the next plan of action. As the restoration is focused on rebuilding from all the antics they've been up to, now is the prime time to attack Eggman's new capital city where Starline will upload his override program. Surge agrees that it'd be great to scramble Eggman with his own bots, but Starline is quick to interject, saying that they only plan to pacify Eggman. Sonic and Tails are their only terminal targets, to which she casually agrees and apologizes. And that is where part three ends. Part four actually starts off in a flashback, showing us the early days of the metal virus, with Starline still at Eggman's side. And I guess we'll see how important this scene is for the overall story, but I love what it brings to Sonic lore, where Starline just asks, what's the point of all the theme parks? And Eggman just says, I like theme parks. But Starline pushes forward, still confused as they're not remotely practical. They could be using those resources for something else. And Eggman says, I don't settle for the world as it is. He's going to make it what he wants it to be. And if he wants his enemy's last moments to be carousel music and the smell of petroleum-based cotton candy, well, he's going to make it happen. This is still early on before Starline found everything Eggman did impractical, so he's just gobbling all this stuff up. And we cut to the present. While Starline isn't the type to build theme parks, the overall message is still important to him. He plans to make the world in his own image. It is finally time for Starline to set his master plan into action. The beginning of a new era where he controls the narrative. He will guide the world and its people out of their complacency. And with that, they launch their attack on Eggman's capital city, smashing through a bunch of classic badniks, making short work of some larger mechs and just, yeah, a lot of lovely callbacks to Sonic Heroes and other games of the past here. The plan isn't stealth, at least not for Kit and Surge. They need to draw all the attention to the two of them while Starline goes and uploads his override algorithm. And they do just that, as we cut over to Eggman, as well as Orbot and Cubot, and they quickly address that, yeah, they have spent quite a long time away from them if you recall back from issue 40. Not super important, just I like that they're keeping the cannon in check here. Anyway, yeah, they quickly get reports from the city that Surge and Kit are attacking. This leaves Eggman utterly confused as the reports sounded like Sonic and Tails were causing a mess. He has no idea who these two are. Doesn't really matter either way to Eggman. Point is, they're wrecking his stuff. So he sends Metal Sonic out to take care of them. And here we have a fun fight between Surge and Metal. And as powerful as Surge has proven herself so far in this narrative, it becomes pretty clear pretty quickly that she can't take metal as he dodges every one of her attacks and dishes out some pretty serious damage. But with a newfound teamwork between these two, Kit manages to trap the infamous robot in a sphere of water while Surge overloads him with electricity, bringing the fight to an end. With metal out of the picture, Starline makes his move and finally reveals himself to Eggman, and at the same time sending out his command over 
override to every single one of his badniks as we see them respond to the signals from all around the world, including the little motobug, which we did see happen in issue 49, as well as Orbot and Cubot, who are quickly overpowered by Eggman. But Eggman doesn't look impressed and opens an escape chute, while Starline makes his way over to Eggman's command chamber, taking his seat at the overthrown top of the Eggman Empire. Everything is now in place for Starline to take over the world. That is until he finds out that Eggman had somehow managed to escape into his memorial garage. But Starline's not worried about it. Even if he is in a garage full of outdated mechs, he'll take command of them whenever Eggman brings them online. But Eggman is no idiot, as he hops into a mech with an offline boot up, meaning he has full manual control of his robot, so it's gonna be fun to see how he responds to Starline. Starline's assault. And while Starline sends the badniks out into the world, Kit and Surge just wait for Sonic and Tails. And once they're taken care of, they will turn their attention over to Dr. Starline. And that is where the story ends. So there you go, guys. That is the Imposter Syndrome miniseries. And I'm going to get some of my negatives out of the way before I break down what I liked because I ended up liking quite a bit more than I expected here. One of my biggest issues would have to be that this is required reading for issue 50 coming up here, arguably even more so than the main series from what we've been reading from these last couple months. So it builds up to a conclusion that it never gets to, which is all well and fine. But considering that a lot of these books nowadays are built with trade paperbacks in mind, as in they're better read when it's all put together, I can imagine this can leave something of an unsatisfying taste in a reader's mouth if their first experience with the story is in the collected volume. But honestly, that's not a huge gripe, just a potential problem for a new reader, but I ain't a new reader, so I'm not going to pretend that's going to be much of a problem for me. The bigger issue for me, and this has been a problem every time this artist is on board, is the art itself. Not saying there isn't talent on display here, obviously there is, but I do draw, and I I know quick lines when I see them, and this art just feels a little too fast for me, if that makes any kind of sense. There's just not enough time dedicated to adding some detail where it could otherwise be used. The characters are very expressive and the action is kinetic, which is always welcome considering they only have static drawings to work with to display this stuff. But a lot of the time, when it comes to the backgrounds or anything else related to that, it just looks like scribbles. I mean, look at the entrance of the egg cave here. Like, just no effort in that sign whatsoever. Granted, this is still a massive step up from the worst of the worst of the Archie books, but all the same, I do expect a little bit better when it comes to IDW Sonic. I suppose that is a good problem to have, but it's just something that did distract me. All that said though, once again, I am very impressed with the unique characters brought in from this particular series, because yet again, this is where you can get really complicated and interesting personalities, where you otherwise can't find in the more static game characters. And I have to admit, I ended up liking Surge and Kit far more more than I expected. Part of me felt like Surge was just a big F you to Ken Penders because he spends all of his time on Twitter just talking about the Lara Sue Chronicles or how he owns Surge or any of these other Archie characters, which I guess is in contention now. We'll do more research on that. And if you're not aware of that, Scourge is a green anti-Sonic from the Archie series. And the only reason that Ken would have any ownership over that is because he first penned the storyline of evil Sonic way back in the day. That was all there really was to the character, just an evil version of the hero, which is nothing new in fiction, but Ken was the first to craft that story and build up that background for said character, and in turn, could make the argument that evil Sonic was his own separate character from Sonic. But yeah, Ken left the book after like a 15 year run, and evil Sonic was still part of that canon. Of course, there wasn't a great need for him when we already had Metal Sonic and, at that point, Shadow. So when Ian Flynn took over the book, one of the first things he did was do something unique with evil Sonic. Sonic. Powered him up with Master Emerald Energy, turning his fur green, tearing up that leather jacket a little bit and adding some <laughs> obnoxious flame decal on it as well, putting a scar on his chest and evolving him to the character Scourge. And bluntly, that's where most of the intrigue of the character actually begins, at least in the fandom. While there are plenty of Sonic clones out there in all kinds of Sonic canons, Scourge was used to show what Sonic could be if he ever did turn evil, directly challenging Sonic's morality on more than a couple of occasions. And from there, he went and got his own storylines and he became interesting in his own right, and as such became a fan favorite in ways he never was when he was just plain old evil Sonic. But after that lawsuit situation with Ken Penders, he was 
dropped from the Archie canon, as well as a lot of other creations from Ken. Seemingly never to be heard from ever again, well, an attempt was made, but the great big stinky argument surrounding Scourge is who has true ownership of the character. It is based off of Sonic, who is Sega's IP. Evil Sonic, while not an entirely creative offshoot of Sonic, still was seen as his own unique character, but didn't truly become interesting until Flynn took that idea and added some new elements to make him stand out from any other Sonic villain or clone out there. But according to Ken, since he was the first one to create Evil Sonic and work with that specific character in stories during his tenure, he owns that character regardless of what he evolved into. But since he doesn't own the IP of Sonic the Hedgehog, he can't actually do anything with Evil Sonic. So he's just kind of caught in a limbo. Fast forward to more modern days and the announcement of Surge the Tenric. There are some very obvious parallels between Scourge and Surge, but Flynn and the rest of the creative team can't flat out say that this is based off of Scourge, as it might open them up to some legal ramifications, but at the same time, they are skirting the line as best they can and basically put up a giant middle finger to Ken Penders. What they've essentially done here is take all the unique elements that they brought onto Evil Sonic, removed it from that character, and created something brand new. So instead of whining about it for years on end on Twitter, Flynn took those ideas and with these new restrictions in mind, managed to creatively get out of that situation and give us something similar to what came before, but also something brand new. This is not the first time he's done this, and quite frankly, I am incredibly impressed. Because not only do we see a lot of Scourge in Surge's design, but the overall narrative on display here, in this story anyway, has a lot to do with being a clone, being a copy. And we're exploring this idea in a very different way from anything we've seen with Scourge, and ironically, something we could potentially see with Metal Sonic that we probably can't because he needs to be this one static thing, or, you know, he doesn't have a mouth. Like I keep saying, there are plenty of Sonic clones and Dark Mirror copy characters to the point that it does get kind of redundant, so you have to have a unique spin every single time you pull off something like this, and they managed to do that yet again. They talk about Sonic a whole lot in this story, and yeah, Surge's initial central drive is to destroy Sonic, but interestingly enough, she has not yet met Sonic. We got four issues dedicated to her and Kit, and not once did they need Sonic to play off of. She starts off as a copy, but by the end of issue four, that's not the most interesting thing about her. What's interesting about her and Kit is all the mystery surrounding their origins. Who were they before Starline? And why did Starline specifically choose them? And speaking of Starline specifically, I love how they built up his character through this entire series. You could argue that he is the true antagonist of all of IDW Sonic. His entire drive now is this meta-narrative about the quite-on-the-nose named Sonic Cycle, something I and others have complained about, which is, well, Sonic is in this kind of static place and he's not really allowed to evolve in any kind of way. They went and turned that into an engaging narrative in this story, going so far as to display Surge and Kit as video game characters who go through obstacle courses and die in all these horrific ways that are actually fairly normal in the video games, falling down pits or getting hit by bad or getting stabbed with spikes, all while being constantly revived as if they had a bunch of extra lives. Flynn has always done a great job of integrating more game-like mechanics into a narrative, which I've always appreciated because Sonic is a video game character, and I love seeing that care brought into the actual storytelling, as opposed to being flat-out ignored, which a lot of other Sonic media has done. It's not always necessary, and in some cases it should probably be left separate, but we've had 30 years to brew over a lot of these ideas, and again, we have some creative ways to implement them into stories. And quite frankly, taking these classic mechanics and then reinterpreting them into this dark, twisted way is really genius. And again, I wonder if there is an extra commentary layer on top of that about fans dictating what Sonic should be without ever really taking care of the actual character. There's just a lot at play here, more than I really expected, and I probably should have known better at this point reading as much as I have of IDW, but I'm always impressed with how smart a lot of this stuff is. Yes, some of the crush 40 lines get a little too on the nose for my liking. I did see people complain about that on Twitter, and I do kind of agree, but not to the point where it actively bothered me. I did also see a lot of people complaining about Metal Sonic losing the Surgeon Kit on Twitter as well, and I thought this was fine. The entire point of them is to be a superior copy to Sonic, to the point where they're supposed to flat out replace Sonic. Starline sees Metal Sonic as a vanity project, and his purpose was to outclass not only Sonic, but Metal Sonic as well. So it only made sense to me to have Surgeon and Kit go up against the robotic copy of Sonic before they go over Sonic himself, showing just how much of a threat they can 
plan B. He did put up a very good fight. The only reason he lost is because he just didn't pay enough attention to Kit. This was a nice evolution through this story showing how they became a better duo, and they are far more dangerous together than they are apart. Neither of them could have soloed Metal Sonic. It was only until they combined their abilities did they have a chance of winning, and even still, it's not like Metal Sonic is down for the count forever. He just short-circuited. I could see him winning a fight. It's just a case of a coin flip. They were that close in abilities. And all that said, we do need to have some new challenges brought into play here. Otherwise, the stories get boring very quickly. I need a new threat to go up against Sonic. And yeah, even Metal Sonic on occasion. He shouldn't be the be-all, end-all of Sonic villains. And before I forget about it, ironically enough, is Kitsunami, whose very purpose is to be kind of overlooked. Very soft-spoken, very submissive. Not a lot of attention is given to Kit, and I think that is intentional. Surge is loud, she's out there, she is the center of attention. Kit is made to be her backup, and they only won their two fights against Starline and Metal Sonic when their enemies disregarded the little blue fox. Hell, even that giant badnik, I completely forgot about that too. Every single one of those scenarios, Surge was on the ropes until Kit jumped in, showing off that he has a lot more power than he initially lets on, hinting at some truly terrifying abilities. I do think he's an interesting counterpoint to Tails. If you compare him to early Fleetweight Tails or some of the other extra media, he's just this dumb kid that gets in Sonic's way, and in turn, Sonic tends to treat him like crap. We see that idea in Kit and Surge and then elevated to the most unhealthy extreme, but even that evolves through this story. And yeah, we see their true potential when they work together, which was Starline's intent. And ironically, it's because they're reaching their full potential that will likely lead to his own downfall. And another little thing I just thought about too, I was kind of rolling my eyes for a little bit here because they were repeating a lot of the same story beats from bad guys. Basically, they go and invade a base, but it's not the actual base they care about. So they're going to go and invade a secondary base. But before that happens, Starline's allies discover his video diaries, therefore ruining the plan. But I love that they subverted that by showing that Starline has been through this particular process with the two of them before and is just kind of bored of it at this point. I do think it's a little bit silly that he has not upped his security measures or just flat out deleted the video files. But it could be argued that is Starline's arrogance once again on display. He just thinks so little of his creations that he doesn't really care if they discover what they're about because he's just going to reboot them anyway. And honestly, this twisted platypus probably enjoys watching this all play out and asserting his control over them. Like he is a genuinely evil character and he is so fascinating. I love the crap out of him. But yeah, that's enough rambling for now. It was nice to see Flynn's three glitch characters finally come into reality in some form or fashion. And I really liked how they all played off each other. It's a shame that that had to wrap up so early. Maybe they will become a proper trio in the future, or maybe not. Every time it seems like Starline is about to build a proper relationship that is fun to read through, he does something to screw it up. All the same, it did the trick. I'm properly excited for issue 50, and I can't wait to look into that. And of course, we're going to have to look at Scourge a little bit more thoroughly, and Surge and Kit when we have a little bit more of their backstory in hand. But as drawn out as it could have been between the months here, this is a very solid start for these two characters, and I'm looking forward to see what's next. All of that said, I want to thank everybody for sticking through this whole video. I'm very sorry it's been a while since I've been uploading, but the drought is now over. I've been overworking myself a little bit, both with the Mecha March Madness from a couple months ago and, well, just outside factors. So I appreciate your patience and an extra special thank you to all the patrons who've been supporting me this whole time. And let me shout out the Turtleoid Warrior tier, who include Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Kitsi Monroe, Faison Razul, Xanroni the Painter, Trey Nobles, Hatsworth, Ginger Bob, Nick S, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Bouge, World's Greatest Bard, Rain, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fish Flop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Orange, Orange. <laughs> Shodan, Mr. SP, Cecil the Glade, The Dark Neon, Missing No, Stefan Plakonica, Three Monic, Ty Cyan, Graham J. Hall, Lenny the Warm-Blooded Carnivorous Tortoise. I respect that, Lenny. I mean, no tortoise is warm-blooded, and not a single one of them is carnivorous, but I, I get you. Actually, you know what? That's not entirely true. There are tortoises out there that will scoop up an easy kill. I've watched a tortoise eat a bird before. It's wild. They mostly just graze, but yeah, nature doesn't give a crap about our rules. Where was I? 
Oh yeah, Wayne is boss, Lederick, 64 bits, David 20, cover your hands, Ryan Rolfs, the lumberjack, Otis Small, mute, trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, SSG, Infinite Sonic, that Pyra Main, Mui Saxi, Jin Seotome, Dream Boaten, Cunning Wise, Nezend, Enerjack 5, Grayson Coniger, Sherrod the Hedgehog, HR Hoffman, Spades the Nocturne. Also, thank you for the happy birthday message, Spades. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you about that one. Ken K, Ven 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, Charlo Bun, 3 Rule 4, Twilord, Ad Zinko, and Paisley. A lot of generous people, and I'm so honored I get to say your names at the ends of these videos, guys. Thank you so much for your support. And hey, forgot to mention, if you're gonna be at too many games at the end of June, be sure to track me down. I'm gonna be there with Wayne and Cirrus and some of our other friends, so hope to see you there. But until next time, toot toot, Sonic Warriors.